We welcome back in Washington, D.C., Ivan Semenuk, science journalist and a news editor for the journal Nature. Tonight, we look at the potential for life on Mars and what that might mean for future space exploration. Hi again, Ivan. Hello there. Okay, we humans have landed on the moon and Mars has been touted for years as the next place to get to. Uh, are we anywhere near that? To, to have people on Mars, I would say no. It's a long, long way away, and as we discussed earlier this week, you know, the future for NASA is a long and complicated one, even just figuring out uh, what the next stage is for, for human space flight. So, so we're quite far from seeing human explorers on Mars. That doesn't necessarily stop us from, or stop planetary scientists from exploring Mars from the perspective of past habitability. It was Mars a place that once could have harbored life? And in fact, the next installment in that search begins this year, uh, something called the Mars Science Laboratory. It's basically a rover the size of a small car, so quite a bit larger, more robust than the, uh, the two Mars rovers that were sent in, in 2004. Uh, the launch date for this mission is uh, towards the end of November this year, and uh, if all goes well, it should be setting wheels down uh, on the Martian surface about a year from now, uh, and we'll be starting to see pictures from a new landing site and, and undergoing that, that next stage of Mars exploration. Okay, so we're going to get vehicles to Mars and already have, but how important is it to get people there in terms of us getting a true and a better understanding of Mars? Well, it's a, you know, that's a really interesting debate because uh, um, th there's sort of two things at, at, at work. Uh, Mars, as seen, Mars is seen as an interesting place to explore from the perspective of a place that might have once had life. We don't know if it ever had life. The one thing we can say, I, I think quite fairly certain now, uh, as a consequence of the, the other rover missions that, are, that, that uh, occurred uh, you know, in recent years, there, has, there was water uh, on Mars in the past. It was a watery environment, and sometime, for some periods of time, that water was present on the surface for long periods. So, so that creates the possibility of an environment for life. Uh, so that's an important thing to explore. That's not necessarily something you need people to do, um, but then the question is, is there a role for human explorers? Mars is also held up as sort of the next, one of the next logical places for human astronauts to go. Uh, people have s been sent to the moon. The moon was a major challenge to get the Apollo astronauts there. It was a fabulous experience. Uh, uh, you know, an incredible adventure that humans were able to set foot on the moon, and I think it changed everyone's perspective of Earth's place in the universe, kind of seeing the Earth rising over the moon's surface. So, so the, uh, th that was a watershed moment, mm. but Mars is so much further beyond the moon, and, and it's different in, in many ways. Uh, for example, the moon is in orbit around the Earth. It's always the same distance away. So, you know, you can figure out how to get to the moon, and, and it's always going to be there. Mars uh, is another planet. It, it comes close and it moves away as Earth and Mars follow their separate paths around the Sun. So that means getting to Mars has to be done in a way that times out with Mars being nearby when you're sending the mission. It would take many, many months to get there. You would then, by the time you get there, Earth and Mars would be far apart. You might need to spend a year or more before you could imagine coming back. It's an entirely different kind of uh, prospect. Uh, and, and there are some major challenges because, uh, among other things, the, it, it exposes astronauts to the harsh radiation environment in space for, for months and months at a time. Uh, you know, and and there we ha the technology has not yet been developed to protect astronauts from that kind of space radiation for that amount of time. So there's, there, there are some deadly uh, uh, issues there. And then also just the trying to leave the Earth and enter another planet's atmosphere and land and touch down safely on another planet. This is not a, an easy thing to accomplish. So, so it's, a far, it's a far goal. Um, it, but it, it may be that those goals are even mutually uh, opposed. It, it, it's hard to say. Some people would say um, if you can put a human on Mars, they can do so much more than a robot because in addition to sort of having that human flexibility and dexterity, uh, you've got the human brain right there on the surface. Uh, uh, someone 
trained, who can make decisions and decide, let's not explore there, let's explore here, this looks more promising, the kinds of things that a machine really can't do. So that argument would speak to, if we can put people there, we'll, we'll get more exploring done and learn more faster. Uh, but of course the cost is very high and, uh, and also there's the contamination factor. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for signs of life, inevitably those human astronauts are going to be bringing life in some form with them, uh, in bacterial form, life from Earth will to some extent contaminate the part of Mars that they come in contact with and that's going to be hard to control uh, because you can't sterilize a human. Uh, you know, there, we all have bacteria with us. So, so that's going to be a, a, another interesting challenge. And I think before, but having said that, it, the, 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 uh, the Mars exploration program that NASA has laid out is seen to fulfill multiple roles. And one of them is kind of paving the way for human exploration whenever that happens, but also for looking into the past of Mars and seeing if it was a place that once was alive. But I have to say, I mean, when you're talking about it and all these enormous challenges. I mean, it sounds like a futuristic sci-fi uh, idea, that it's not based in tons of reality, if I can put it that way. I mean, are we, are we just dreaming about Mars still? Well, you know, it's, it's, here's why Mars is, is more than just sci-fi. Um, the question about whether there's life else there in the universe is really one of the most fundamental questions we can ask in science. You know, just think of how, think of the big revolutions we've had in biology, understanding evolution, understanding the cell, now understanding DNA and genetics, and, and all of these things that, that have given rise to the most, most complex systems that we know in nature. You know, uh, animal systems, multicellular life, the human brain, it's all a function of biology. But in all of this, we just have one example of life. Everything that we study, everything biologists look at, is related only to life on Earth, you know, life based on DNA. So uh, it would be tremendously interesting and useful to see if there are other forms of life. And perhaps the only way to find them would be to look for other signs of life, past or present, uh, on other worlds. Now, there are other places we could look in our own solar system. Uh, you know, Europa, which is this fascinating moon of Jupiter, covered in ice, but believed to have a subsurface ocean. Perhaps there's something alive down there, or perhaps the, the conditions for life are present on Europa. There's Enceladus, a small moon of Saturn, which, you know, for some unknown reason is spewing water vapor out into space. These large geysers have been observed on uh, this tiny moon and it's likely that there's some water down below that's being heated up by some unknown process. So these are also potential places that are habitats for life, but they are much farther away and much harder to explore, whereas Mars is just sitting there, it's got this open surface, you can land something, and even though getting to Mars is not easy, it's actually easier than a lot of other places in the solar system. So that's one reason why Mars keeps coming up again and again. And we know there was water there, uh, so, and we know that you know, water is one of those key ingredients for life, so characterizing whether there was also energy available, whether there was also, wh whether the nutrients or the, the building blocks of life were also present at the same time, that's, that's the main goal. Okay, we'd spend a lot of money, a lot of money, trying to chase life in our solar system. Is it time, Ivan, just to maybe call off the chase, just give it up? Well, when this question comes up, I like to point something out, which is that, uh, you know, relatively speaking, Canada has spent very little, very, very little on this pursuit. Uh, you know, the Canadian space program, its entire budget is just a fraction of what this one Mars rover would be, for example. Now, the U.S. taxpayers, they really have spent a lot of money. <laughs> they absolutely have. Uh, you know, uh, the Mars Science Laboratory will be uh, basically a billion dollar project and, uh, you know, it's, you, people may well ask here, uh, is this really worth it? Uh, and I think at this point there's still a sense that these fundamental questions are worth pursuing. Uh, we don't know how common life is in the universe. Uh, we know that there are places, at least one place in the universe, where life is incredibly abundant here on Earth. We know that there are other places, like the moon, where you can never imagine life. It's entirely devoid of life. It, it just seems, wh wherever the boundary is, 
for, for how easy life can be, the moon is well beyond it. So, but then you have these marginal cases, this in-between case like Mars, uh, and tr even going to Mars, looking and not finding life would tell us something important. It would help, un help us understand how rare life is in the universe, and I think that is a question that humans are, are hungering over time to, uh, to answer. But it's a good point, like how fast do we have to answer it and how much money, how much should we invest? Well, you know, at the moment this is, this is what's happening. You know, Stephen Hawking would say, has said, that we actually need to, to be doing this, that the future of humankind is in danger uh, and its future must be in space. Given that he says that, Ivan, I mean, is the idea of humans living on other planets even on the table? Well, I think that in the 1960s and 70s, it seemed a lot closer. It seemed like we were just one step away from, you know, having people in the final frontier, you know, that kind of Star Trek universe. I think now we, we understand the popular perception now is that, okay, it's, it's not that easy to be in space. And, you know, humans are evolved to live here on Earth. The gravity, the lighting, the atmosphere, we're tuned to be Earthlings. So it's not going to be that easy to pluck people off of Earth and, and put them in other places. However, uh, you know, the long, long-term future may indeed involve humans going to space. And you can imagine that happening in a few ways. We might alter an environment, like, for, you know, people talk about terraforming Mars, literally changing the environment on Mars over many thousands of years to make it more amenable to, to life as we know it. But we could also imagine tailoring ourselves. I mean, we are now tinkering uh, with, the, with our genome uh, and uh, just play that forward a, a few centuries and perhaps we can tinker forms of life ourselves that can actually occupy other ecological niches elsewhere in the universe. In fact, there are some scientists who would say that it's our duty to do this, that, that uh, you know, that life uh, in and of itself is a good in the universe and that uh, if we can manage to put life elsewhere in the universe where life currently does not exist, we should try and do that. This is sort of the long view over, over millions of years. We're very young species. We're very new at this game. Uh, we, as far as we know, we haven't found anyone else who's, who's been doing this. But if that's our ultimate future, then at some point we have to take those steps. I'm wondering, you know, you, we talk about the U.S. when we talk about space exploration mostly, and we talk about the Russians a little bit, and Canada because we're Canadians, but what about, you know, big powers like China and that? Where do they fit into this, this puzzle of trying to discover life beyond Earth? Right. Well, China's definitely pursuing its own program. It's, uh, it's now launched successfully astronauts into space. It's sort of following in the footsteps of uh, what the Soviets and, and what the U.S. Uh, did earlier. It's going to have a space station of some kind. And, uh, you know, it seems to be engaged in a fairly long-term investment in space. Whether they'll also be exploring the, uh, the solar system, it's another, it's, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, but, you know, it may be that China will be a big player in the future. At the moment, uh, here in the U.S., there's a very interesting political battle going on about how much uh, collaboration should be allowed. In fact, the, the current budget legislation explicitly prohibits uh, NASA from collaborating with China. China is not a member of the International Space Station, for example. But I think in the future we may see, uh, see some changes. Uh, certainly, one way or another, China is going to be a player in space. Ivan, mean, we have just about a minute left, but I want to ask you this. You know, we're always searching for life on planets according to our way that we define the life. And I'm wondering, are we looking for the right things? That's a great question, and that's a question that's also been actively pursued by scientists like Paul Davies, for example, at the Origins Institute. The, the point there is that maybe life is everywhere in the universe, and, and we simply can't recognize it, and that the signal we should be looking for is very different. I mean, at the moment, the SETI program has been going on, looking for radio signals from the universe, from people who might be somewhat like us, sending radio broadcasts out into space, just as we are. 
Uh, and you know, after 50 years, we haven't heard anything yet. Now, you might say we've just started, but 50 years is a long time, and it, it, obviously there isn't a big, uh, uh, a, a big broadcast. Uh, uh, set, you know, there aren't lots of channels out there to listen to. So it, it may well be that for us, life will be something we discover gradually as we come to realize, oh, this thing that we were observing for some period of time, we didn't even realize it, but we're actually looking at life. Or it might be very obvious and it might hit us right over the head. No, no one knows, but that's, that's still the exciting uh, future that, that drives people forward in this area. Okay, Ivan, thanks for this. Thank you.